You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 15, Sonnet 14. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if, if I, I say I'm not, not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if, if I, I say I will never, never surrender? I was scheduled to tattoo sonnets 4 and 5 this week, but a last minute redesign of sonnet 5 meant that there wasn't much time for it, and I'm certainly not doing any rush jobs on such a serious and permanent project. Sonnet 4, the $4 bill, was painful, but definitely more manageable than the others so far, and the quality of the work and level of detail is just phenomenal. It states the united sonnets and in the words we trust, and Shakespeare's coat of arms is a perfect replacement for the eagle with its heraldic shield. If you haven't already heard episode 5, I invite you to listen to it to hear why I feel that this image best represents Sonnet 4. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and as importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Every dollar helps to breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnet so much more accessible. And of course, 10 times that dollar will bring you the finished product 10 times faster. While compiling my notes for analyzing Sonnet 14, I came across a comparison to Sonnet 26 of Sidney's Astrophil and Stella. It's important to note that Shakespeare made no bones about his influences, and he explicitly refers to his process in Sonnet number 78. Yet be most proud of that which I compile, whose influence is thine and born of thee. In others' works thou dost but mend the style, and arts with thy sweet graces graced be. Shakespeare's skills did not lie in coming up with original stories, but in combining and enhancing existing ones, both for his plays and for his sonnets. Having said that, I feel obliged to discuss our modern fixation on originality, a fixation that is only about a century old, which stems from a handful of famous modernist poets who, in my opinion, have done immense damage to our notions of storytelling and poetry. One of my favorite moments in literary history occurred in 2003, when Seamus Heaney, winner of the 1995 Nobel Prize in Literature, validated and praised Eminem's poetry alongside that of Bob Dylan and John Lennon. Poetry has evolved over the course of thousands of years, and for most of a century we've relegated it to bored classrooms, while academics hunt for a level of originality that even in biblical terms had been established to be a wild goose chase with the expression, there is nothing new under the sun. Rhyme and meter make poetry fun. They make poetry better. We need no further evidence than the number of non-poets who've memorized volumes of rap lyrics versus the number of people who've bothered to read any of the prize-winning literature of the last hundred years. If Shakespeare were alive today, he'd be 100% hip-hop and laughing all the way to the bank. So to go back a step, did Shakespeare lift Sonnet 14's conceit from Sydney? It really doesn't matter. The story told by his sonnets remains original in a way that is, at least as far as I can tell, unsurpassed. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 14. Not from the stars do I my judgment pluck, and yet methinks I have astronomy. But not to tell of good or evil luck, of plagues, of darts, or season's quality. As discussed in the first episode, whenever we read about stars, it's generally a reference to the eyes of Narcissus' reflection in Ovid's Metamorphosis. In this sonnet, however, the stars serve as both the reflection's eyes and the stars in the sky that astrologers read. Bear in mind, astronomy in Shakespeare's time described what we call astrology today. The word judgment follows the previously established legal theme, but brings in the biblical element of judgment day. This is confirmed in the closing couplet's reference to doom and date. I find it interesting that the expression to pluck up carried the meaning of to summon up from as early as the 14th century, which is what we do to Shakespeare's spirit whenever we engage with the sonnets, and I'm fairly confident that it also refers to the plucking of a string in line with the musical theme established in Sonnet 8. Putting all that together, this opening quatrain becomes quite dense. Shakespeare is plucking his judgment from the fates, and the sonnets pluck their judgment from their creator. Both are telling each other, 
and the reader about themselves and their fortune, but not in the simple whims and conceits that astrologers are known to pander to. Nor can I fortune to brief minutes tell, pointing to each his thunder, rain, and wind, or say with princes if it shall go well, by oft predict that I in heaven find. The second quatrain reinforces the first's conceit. While I'm sure there's plenty of interesting material in there, I don't believe it would significantly alter this interpretation of the sonnet. I wouldn't be surprised to learn that it contains some interesting numerical references. As it is, the first use of the word thunder in the first book of Golding's translation in Ovid's Metamorphosis is in line 62, so in case you're curious, here's me reading from the line before. There hath he placed mist and clouds, and for to fear men's minds, the thunder and the lightning eke with cold and blustering winds. Compare that to, to each his thunder, rain, and wind, and that's pretty close. The next interesting mention of thunder accompanies the lightning that Zeus sent down to destroy Phaethon, Phoebus's prince, who has already been referenced in Sonnet 7 and whose father warned him not to drive the sun's chariot through the heavens. Coincidence? Probably not. But from thine eyes my knowledge I derive, and constant stars, in them I read such art, as truth and beauty shall together thrive, if from thyself to store thou wouldst convert. The word derive is a peculiar choice, coming from the old French to flow, pour out, originate, and in the 16th century English evolving from obtain by a process of reasoning to include arise by a process of word formation. The thrive is interesting as well, because in addition to the meaning we're familiar with, it's strongly related to the word thrift, which has only been used in sonnets 2, 4, 9, and 13. Last week I mentioned this, but only searched for the word unthrift, leaving out sonnet 2 from that subsequence. The word thrive is only found in sonnets 14, 80, and 125, the latter numbers being 4 times 20 and 5 times 25, respectively. So at some point we should probably examine all these sonnets for a thematic relationship, even if the math for sonnet 14 doesn't seem to fit. It's always interesting to me how many of the sonnet lines can be read in a variety of ways based on where the emphasis is placed. We all know the Oxford comma joke of the panda bear eats shoots and leaves. If we read line 9 as, but from thine eyes my knowledge I derive, we can hear Shakespeare deriving his own knowledge back from the sonnets, literally reading his own words back to himself. The more straightforward reading of that is that the sonnets are deriving their knowledge from Shakespeare. In the constant, fixed, invariable sonnet windows into Shakespeare's soul, we find truth and beauty together, as they have been converted from the original biological bard. This conceit also works when speaking to the reader, albeit in a much more roundabout manner. Metaphorically, the sonnet can read the reader's eyes to see what kind of store they will provide for Shakespeare's words, and literally, Perhaps the sonnet reads its own words being reflected in the reader's eyes. Or else of thee this I prognosticate. Thy end is truth and beauty's doom and date. Shakespeare is plucking his doom from the hands of fate by writing his spirit into the sonnet sequence, which is summoned by the constant stars, the faithful reader's eyes who continue to read the sonnets. The sonnets tell the future, in that they tell the future reader, of the bard's youth, of his love and his loss, of his truth and his beauty. When the reader reaches the end of the sonnet sequence, they will close the book on Shakespeare's truth and beauty and return them to their doom of eternal darkness. But if the sonnets were really to come to an end, if they were destroyed or lost or simply forgotten, that would be the end of Shakespeare's legacy, the bard's final death, our ever-living poet's doom. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, 
please consider signing up to support me at www.patreon.com slash Fisher King. Keep up with the graphic novel at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What if I say I will never surrender?